giants of the gridiron, Sunday is a solemn occasion with no time for comedy. They believe that pro football is not a laughing matter. NFL Films believes otherwise. Richard, what are you doing? What they're doing is adding a few sour notes to a sport that's usually played with classical precision. They're also proving that while football is a game of blood and thunder, it is also a game of thud and blunder. For 20 years, NFL Films has presented the human drama of pro football. But it has also captured the human folly. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. NFL Films has produced five screen classics that have highlighted the lowlights of pro football. Now, together again for the first time, we present a collection of the best and most bizarre business from those five fabulous Follies films. Plus some brand new bloopers from our fantastic pile of foul-ups. It's all in one big explosive package. It's all in Best of the Football Follies. Hello, I'm Steve Sable, and here in the NFL Films Library is the history of pro football. These cans contain the raw material for the films that we've been producing for the last two decades. While we're proud that we've helped create the myth of a great sport, we've also been concerned with the mirth. So we've depicted pro football as not only a game with plenty of oomph, but plenty of oops. When Johnny Carson started showing our football foul-ups on The Tonight Show back in the late 1960s, the enthusiastic response led us to produce the first sports film ever that was entirely devoted to bloopers and blunders, and we called it the Fabulous Football Funnies. That film and the four subsequent Follies films that came after it are among the most popular we've ever made. For the next hour, you're going to see some of the more memorable sequences and shots from our Follies series, plus some fresh material from the last two NFL seasons. And we think you'll agree that just as the greatest plays in NFL history always send chills up the spine, the game's greatest goofs will always tickle the funny bone. Something evil is lurking out there. Something to make you feel the cold breath of horror on the back of your neck. Something to chill your spine. It is stalking the stadiums, seeking out victims to satisfy its unquenchable thirst for blood. And heaven help those who gaze at the thing that rained hell on opening day. <laughs> On opening day, you'll experience creeping terror when a depraved, malignant force takes possession of Sunday's heroes and transforms them into predatory fiends. Their prey are the men who wear the black and white stripes. At first, the officials are taunted. The refs try to fight back. But these beasts crave human flesh. You screamed on Halloween. You shrieked on Friday the 13th. Now prepare to gag on opening day. 
This motion picture contains scenes that may be too intense for young people. Deep in the valleys of the seething, sultry old Southwest, where danger dwells, an unforgettable Western adventure is born. First, there was the Magnificent Seven. Now, there is the Mediocre Eleven. Here is a sprawling saga of itchy trigger fingers, hot lead, and a cool, silent shootist called Butch. Relive the days when peril loomed over every horizon. See savages and settlers engage in the life and death struggle that helped bring civilization to the wild and woolly frontier. Join the stampede to see the Western epic that leaves the others in the dust. NFL Films challenges you to solve the mystery that baffled Scotland Yard. The stomach-churning suspense begins with a phone call. Is that our phone? Is that us? Hello, Danny? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I would like a, a large pizza with uh, everything on it but anchovies. <laughs> you got that? Hold the anchovies. <laughs> Dial in for Moron puts you on the lookout for the crime wave that blows the lid off the NFL. Hold on to your hats as helmets disappear. Grab onto your socks as cleats vanish. Not even jerseys are safe in this searing drama of a half-naked city paralyzed by fear. And when the pigskin starts popping loose, so will your eyes. Who done it? You won't know until the final fade out. And theater owners have been asked not to admit anyone during the last 15 minutes. This is the film that takes you behind today's hottest headlines. See how undercover informants provide police with the tips that lead to the biggest dragnet in FBI history. So when the phone rings, get ready for a heart-pounding motion picture experience. NFL Films proudly presents the picture with happy feet. It's a singing, dancing, musical extravaganza. It's Top Helmet, the tap-filled, tune-filled treat that will have you leaving the theater humming songs like these. I got a feeling Buffalo is going to the Super Bowl. This is not the last time, but Buffalo is going to the Super Bowl. The Steelers are so great, and they play the best of all to take our feet to the Super Bowl. At long last, here comes a high-stepping spectacle to bring the sound of music back into your life. Isn't it time you felt good again? Isn't it time for Top Helmet? Joe Namath forged an image that went far beyond the boundaries of a football field. Although he is not listed among the top 20 quarterbacks in the league record book, his place in the game's history is secure. In 1968, he played the leading role in what could truly be called a fairy tale season. Once upon a time, there was a magic bean that had a magic spell, and fame and glory would belong to whomever could throw it straight and handle it well. All across the land, wise men plotted and planned to see if they would be the man who could hold this bean in hand. But alas, 
It was such a difficult task that no solution could be found. So they dashed it and smashed it in anger on the ground. Now, far, far away in a kingdom on the coast, there was a little prince who made a mighty boast. I'll throw that beam, he said, and straight I'll make it go. There's no doubt about it, said the boy named Broadway Joe. Now, to make this story short, I'll have to report that Broadway Joe was right. For in his arm was a magic charm that controlled the beam and its flight. Broadway Joe traveled far and wide and threw the bean so well that everyone gathered round him to tell him he was swell and scores of lovely maidens attended to his wants and a guard of honor followed him to all his usual haunts. Then from out of the ground there came a sound that shook the entire shore. It came from the tread of some men who said, this Joe is simply a bore. From their fearsome faces, smoke did spew, while their heads were as hard as an old horseshoe. They were rough and tough and worked all day in the sun. They were cranky and cruel and spoiled other people's fun. But Joe's days were filled with smiles and zest, and he turned to these villains and said with a jest, if I happen to meet you guys someday, uh, it'll be best for you to um, get out of my way. What's that, growled those men who were terribly gruff. How can you say such ridiculous stuff? We'll meet you in battle and steal your bean, then use it ourselves to be nasty and mean. And so it came to pass, in a big round castle way down in the south, that these merciless men came to take the bean and shut Joey's mouth. The castle was filled with faces familiar and faces stranger, but all of them knew that Joe was in danger. So they gathered together, put their hands on their breast, and sincerely wished him their very best. But Broadway Joe needed luck of more than one kind because suddenly trouble came from in front and then from behind. They gave him such a knock on the crown that he forgot his bean and left it on the ground. The meanies in blue grabbed the thing and turned it over to their old wizard king. Now everyone rose and stood in alarm to see if the ancient wizard still had magic in his arm. Now in his prime, many ages ago, he could have thrown that bean and hit a dime, but by now his magic arm had spent its force, and when he threw the bean, it just fluttered off course. The wizard's men looked solemn and tragic, and sadly they spoke, this bean's not magic. It's a fraud, a joke. Give it back to the kid. If it obeys his command, we'll admit defeat and crown him king of the land. But the bean was magic, and everyone knew it, and watched in amazement whenever Joe threw it. He hopped and popped and swung with a swish, and the bean obeyed his every wish. As darkness fell on this incredible day, the meanies in blue just faded away. And everyone cheered for Broadway Joe, for he had put on such a spectacular show. His beam was turned to silver, as bright as the eye could see. And Joe returned a hero to his kingdom by the sea. The end.
Reminiscent of the Amelia Earhart and Judge Crater cases, the National Football League has been hit recently by a wave of mysterious disappearances. So far, you've seen how we take creative liberties with some of the footage we've shot during the last 20 years. But our next segment proves the old adage that truth is stranger than fiction. It's the bizarre story of the New Orleans Saints and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we didn't have to make any of it up. All we had to do was let our cameras roll. In fact, when the Bucks were born in 1976, they actually seemed to be rehearsing for one of our Follies films. <laughs> The birth of the Bucks was sort of like the birth of Rosemary's baby. The creature was hideous, but you couldn't turn your eyes away from it. The Bucks displayed a monstrous penchant for losing, and over a three-year span, they made NFL history by dropping 26 consecutive games. While the Bucks supplied the belly laughs, head coach John McKay provided the quips. He prowled and scowled on the sidelines like Don Rickles delivering a monologue to the stage side tables at a Vegas nightclub. You can't stop a pass or a run. Otherwise, we're in great shape. Hey, what's you? What's wrong with playing Mon in the game? Uh, he tackles, huh? We got all these old pros. Nobody tackles. Gentlemen, are you going to put your big man in, or are you going to stand here? We're trying to get the ball to keep it about a week. You're gonna get knocked the back. Well, these guys are almost gutless, man. The ones that aren't that are brainless. We got uh, had to scramble out of there quite a bit. A lot of sacks. Uh, well, we didn't block them, so we made up for it by not tackling. McKay's Bucks resembled a fraternity football team well into their third keg of beer, and their style of play resembled outtakes from Animal House. What we needed was Newt Rockney, and he was not here. We will attempt to come back next Sunday in Tampa Stadium in front of our own crowd. We've now proven we can't play on the road or in front of our own crowd. <laughs> so we, we, we would like to have a neutral site. We went through eight quarterbacks. Every time I looked up, uh, start that guy. Uh, we had no audible system because we had the left guard was from Nova Scotia and the right guard was from, we just picked up from Philadelphia. They barely knew each other's name. These pushovers in the pumpkin-colored jerseys suffered a lot of early knockouts. But in 1979, a fairy tale transformation occurred. The pumpkins turned into a fleet of golden coaches and won the NFC Central Division title. The Bucks had gone from worst to first, and they've been strong contenders ever since. Well, the reason I had a five-year plan, I had a five-year contract. See, I'd have had a six-year plan if I had a six-year contract or a three-year plan. And, and so now everybody says, well, how can McKay be so intelligent in five years? Well, that was the length of the contract. Uh, that's, that's how intelligent I am. While the Bucks eventually wore the look of a winner, the New Orleans Saints have consistently displayed a game face not even a mother could love. These NFL sad sacks took their first baby steps in 1968, and it looked like they would grow up in a hurry when John Gilliam, number 42, took the opening kickoff in their first game and went 94 yards for a touchdown. But while the Saints' opening number was up-tempo, they've been playing the blues ever since. The Saints often seem to be playing every quarter as if they had spent a long night in the French Quarter. And during the first 18 years of their existence, they have never had a winning season. Every year, the Saints have taken a crash course in the School of Hard Knocks. They're still waiting to graduate. Nearly 500 players have known the dizzying, disorienting experience of being a Saint. And some strange birds have perched in the club locker room. Well, we picked up a punt returner. We were in bad need of one, and uh, 
from Oakland, and he came in on a Saturday. He had just been released, and we had a game that night, so they just took him straight to the Superdome, and uh, he didn't really have to learn any plays or anything, so he was going to catch punts that night. And he had a parrot on his shoulder when he came in and started meeting some of the guys. It was a beautiful parrot, and um, it was a little peculiar. But he's supposed to be a good return man, so what? And uh, but I, I was just noticing, you know, I was wondering what he was going to do with that parrot during the game, and we have nice dressing facilities there and a nice kind of a um, little cubby up in our lockers in the dome. And he's put his parrot up there in the uh, in the locker. And uh, someone asked him, was it just going to leave there the whole game? He said, sure, he'll just sit there the whole game. Well, he dropped the first punt, and they never put him back in. So obviously uh, he was going to get the ax. Uh, it was a one-night stand in New Orleans. When we went back in the dressing room after the game was over, that parrot was dead in the, uh, in the locker up there, just just lay it out. One creature who has survived is Gumbo, the team's mascot. Saints fans are as loyal and trusting as Gumbo. They've maintained high hopes for a team with a flair for low comedy. The Saints may have never had a good team, but they've had some great rosters. Now, I don't mean in talent, but in names. Names like Jubilee, Dunbar, D'Artagnan Martin and Guido Merkins are among those who have played for eight different head coaches. The first coach was Hall of Fame receiver Tom Fears. Critics said he couldn't even blow his own nose. They were wrong. The New Orleans Saints have gone marching into 18 NFL campaigns and they've never marched out as a winner. This is truly the ideal team for the city that gave birth to the Blues. The proud foot, I say the proud foot belongs to the kicker whose only concern when kicking is that his mates know who to block. I got 50. I got 76. Joe, no, you got, got 45. Who's got no, 30? I got, 45. I got him. I got that guy. Okay, all set. Hey, who's got 45? I thought you had 45. I've got 77. Who's got 48? Who's I've got, got 48. Oh, I got 88. The... Time out. In kicking, the center, I say the center snap is crucial. Mm. And now, uh, pay attention. The ally of every kicker is his sure hand. I say he's sure handed the holder. If something goes wrong, I say goes wrong, the kicker has some options. Pay attention, boy. There's the double trick kick run and kick real quick stick. Or there's the popular, I say popular strawberry short kick. When it, uh, pay attention, boy. When it comes to kicking, we punt, I say we punters display an affinity for ballet with our fluid movements that sing, I say sing of gracefulness. It's up to the punter to save, I say, to save his team from bad field position. Down through the years, kickers, and players at every other position for that matter, have been the unwitting victims in our Follies films. Two of the greatest causes of their embarrassment have been bad weather and the stadium surroundings themselves. In the Lord said, let there be precipitate, 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 let there be rain. And lo and behold, rain came pouring down, turning all into a quagmire, a quagmire, into a quagmire, and making a real mess of things. And the player said, Lord, we're melancholy, we're pretty darn sad. And the Lord said, 
Get thee some artificial get thee some artificial get thee get thee get thee a rug. And the players did, but when they they saw what they had they wrought, they said, "The Lord, we're melon 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 they're still pretty darn sad." So uh, finally, the Lord said, "Get thee under the, the, the domes, costing you millions of dollars." And the, the, the taxpayers said, L -l -l "Lord, we sure are melon melon Lord, uh, we've sure been given a, a big enough place to take a bath." Besides bad weather, fan and player alike are surrounded by constant dangers lurking in NFL stadiums. such collisions has frightened many a player. In fact, some have never been heard from again. And there are perils aplenty for halftime performers as well. NFL Films was born long after the sunset on Hollywood's golden era, but we've always held a nostalgic affection for the good old days of movie making and I sometimes wonder what it would have been like if NFL films had gotten a chance to produce let's say uh, a silent slapstick movie or or one of those old-fashioned newsreels I imagine they would have looked something like this
NFL News Parade is on the air. New York City. Here, Commissioner Pete Rozelle, monarch of pro football, makes a startling announcement. NFL to adopt the metric standard of weights and measures. Observers view Switch as a patriotic gesture, a move endorsed by world leaders. And so, from snow-capped peaks to desert sands, in every NFL stadium, the metric system becomes the law of the land. A happy Pete Rozelle points with pride to the system's early success. But on other fronts, doubts begin to emerge. Players and fans confused. Headaches. Newly changed field surfaces adjusted to metric standards. Too large for present stadium confines. And so all stadiums are completely remodeled to conform to new regulations. Cost, no man can say. Players no longer measured in feet or pounds. Vendors mourn loss of foot-long hot dog. Sports writers say goodbye to hallowed cliches like three yards and a cloud of dust, and it's a game of inches. Referees now mark off penalties and infractions in centimeters. Confusion pervades. Players and coaches launch angry tirades. So the league calls in experts to educate the public. Now unruly fans threaten to revolt. Officials fear for their safety. The state militia armed and ready for the worst. And so the commissioner acts once more, calling for the one measure that will bring peace. Jubilation sweeps through the player ranks. Pandemonium sweeps the nation. The Hundred Yard War is home to stay. When Shakespeare wrote that all the world is a stage, he obviously wasn't thinking about the NFL. But when a stadium is filled with 80,000 screaming fans, we've discovered that more than a few head coaches become natural performers. We've put wireless microphones on some of the men who call the shots from the sidelines, and our next segment demonstrates that when the stadium clock starts ticking on game day, the effect can be something like the curtain going up on the stage show at the improv or the comedy store. Game day in the NFL. Jeremiah was a bullfrog, huh? For every man who has ever coached, these next few hours of suffering and celebration are what make life worth living. Joy to the world. Joy. All right, everybody sit down. Now, let's everybody sit down. Stay up here with me, Louie. Back up, fellas. Back it up, please, so we can see. Is there any way that we can get these people to sit down? Hey, stay here and make it look like we know what the hell we're doing. Sit. Right. Watch the screen. Watch the reverse, son. Watch your fake, Peters. Nelson. Watch your fake! Watch your fake! Watch your pass! Watch your pass! Watch the play action pass! Watch your fake! Pass! Screen! Flea flicker! Watch your dog! Watch everything! High formation! High formation! Quick 141. High formation, quick 141. 94. Fullback, banana, hot right. Brown left, wide, nasty. 16 lead pass. Post flag with a, to Gloucester. Brown left, wide, nasty. We might as well run it. Yep. Let's run the Bumaruski. Huh? Run the Bumaruski. Bumaruski. Tight line. What we got to run, I'm telling you, it sounds crazy, is an 888. Deep down the middle and hope we get a pass interference. Don't you think? Would you please ask these people to stand back? Everybody. Bobby! Douglas! Douglas! 
Get up Beckman, there, Beckman! Beckman, Beckman, kick it again. Beckman! No, not Jimbo! Beckman! Beckman! Get up there and make him kick it again. Or maybe it's on us. Maybe it's on us. Boy, that, the gears in that guy's mind didn't mesh for a long time, I'll tell you that. Get him out of there, because he has no hands. Boy, you, you know on that 30, 39, you did a poor job. Hey, God, you can't do that. Hell, you're in your home state. No good at all. We went that up straight in the air. What the hell? We getting anybody can kick it out of bounds. That's I don't want you up there running around faking blitzes and getting out of position. You understand? Yes, sir. You line up where you're supposed to line up. None of that Harry High School fake this. Do what we're told. Oh, yeah. You got to tell these guys what to do every minute of the day. This is unbelievable. Yeah. If I don't get them down, I will cut them, baby, so they'll be down. Hey, line, we're going to have to start doing something now. We're going to have to start doing something. The defense is not going to do it, so let's start. What the hell's the matter with you guys? Be alert. Come on, defense. Stop somebody once. I guarantee you next week Step you'll stay back because every guy up here is going to cost 500 you all right, Butch? Coach! Yeah, we we Butch! Butch, are you okay? Butch! Coach! Coach! Drop! Drop! Drop, dummy! Drop! My daughter could do better! My daughter could... You're just a... And the next time everybody will sit on a bench or I'll run every... to Green Bay. I knew we weren't ready to play football today. I knew we weren't ready to play football. Hey, pick up! Pick up! Pick up! Pick up! Pick up right there! Pull his arm! He pull his! He pull him! Tack, do you see the offensive tackle? He literally tackled the strong safety. He had him. He tackled him for crying out loud. Open your eyes! I can't believe that! Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. The ball jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No! What? Hey! Can I tell you one thing? That's three holding penalties on one football team in a quarter and a half. That ain't funny. First down by two feet. Two feet. He's got it easy. He's got it easy. I can't see. Oh, the thing is way over here. He's got it by two feet. You did good. You did good. You marked it good. No, he's all right. First down. That's good. You marked it good. You marked it good. You did a hell of a job. Nice score. Great job. You marked it good. See how your eyes a work? Foot, a you foot. said two feet. All right, well, what's the difference between eight inches and two feet? Five and a half feet. Eight, eight inches. inches. Went to college with that official. <laughs> yeah, I, went to, I did. I went to college with him, huh? Hey, Airman! Hey, you over-officious jerk! If they substitute people in, they've got to stay in. They cannot go back out. They've got to be in for one play. Even I know that. Now, you can't do that. If you do it, I'm telling you, you're going to have more hell over it than a little bit. Oh, there's a clip! Damn, there's a clip! What the hell's wrong with you, 76? Call a clip! You guys are horse out there! I'll tell you, you think that you've given these a little bit of an advantage now? How about turning it around? Oh, that is a crock! They're killing me, Whitey! They're killing me! If you think for one damn minute I'm going to take a loss standing down, you just have another thought for coming. Ah, mouth at 20, you couldn't cover me. <laughs> Come on, baby, one time. One time. One time, baby. One time. One time. Come on, boy! Take it! Come on, boy! Take it! Take it! Come on, turn it car! Turn it car! Turn it car! Turn it car! a bullfrog. The basic formula for our Follies films is fairly simple. Take plenty of pratfalls and funny faces, then put them to script and music. But at the risk of sounding somewhat snobbish, we've also attempted to add a touch of class and culture to our basic formula. I'm about to attend a command performance of two classics of football film comedy the Headcracker Suite, and the High Mom Opera. It's Bach, Brahms, 
Beethoven, and bloopers. Fortuna, fortuna, no me cara. Ay, mamá. 